John D'Angostino is an American business executive and entrepreneur. He is a senior advisor to Coinbase, chairman of U.S. Asset Management Committee for the Department of International Trade, a lecturer at MIT and Columbia, and a Harvard MBA graduate. He previously served as U.S. Managing Director at the world's largest fund governance firm, Waystone Governance, where he also served on the board of hedge funds providing independent oversight. He was previously a Managing Director at Alkion Capital Management, a multi-billion dollar registered investment advisor. John served as VP and Head of Strategy for the New York Mercantile Exchange, where as part of the leadership team, he helped transition the floor to electronic trading. John is also known for his involvement in the early development of the Dubai Mercantile Exchange. John's story was the focus of the book Rigged, the true story of an Ivy League kid who changed the world of oil by New York Times bestselling author Ben Mesrick. John was also featured in The Startup of You by Reid Hoffman in, 12, in 2012. He is the founder of Dagger LLC, a strategic consulting and advisory firm, and in 2019, he was named chair of the UK Consulate's Financial Services Working Group. John D'Agostino, thank you so much for being here on the Life Lab. Really appreciate your time today. Pleasure to be here. I can see you're zooming in from New York City, a little bit of the city in the background. It is a picture-perfect New York City day. And um, we're delighted to have you here on the Life Lab. So, John, let's start off by talking a bit about your background and your upbringing. I know you were born and raised in New York City. Yes, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And you are the first um, generation. Your parents were, were immigrants to, the, to New York City, right, from, from Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my father's on the Sicilian side. My mother's uh, was, was Italian, which they... You know, big difference between Sicilians and Italians. They get very upset if you, uh, if you say they're from the same place. But yes, first generation, um, first member of my family with college, and um, uh, you know, just very fortunate to have a very uh, supportive network uh, growing up. And as a, as a generation Xer, what was it like growing up in New York? Um, in in you're from yeah. Brooklyn, right? Yeah, from Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn to Italian American parents. Um, uh, you know, it was very different. I think about, I have two young children now and I think Gen X in America, at least we were the last generation. I was the last generation where being multilingual and specifically having an accent was considered bad. And, mm. and I, it's, just, it's, a, it's amazing how things change. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I view it as a sign of intelligence, but back then I remember as a, as a child, my, my, most of my family, extended family, we all lived together, uh, had, had very strong Italian accents and spoke Italian. And so naturally as a, as a child, you pick up words and you started to speak Italian and my parents would get mad. They would get scared, you know, tutto americano, you're, you're, you're Italian. We came here to be, Amer you're, you're English. I'm sorry. You're American. We came here to be American, you know, be American. And um, it was a you know very sad uh, sad um, fear because it was based on this perception at least that uh, if you had an Italian accent you were you know not as educated or not as sophisticated and you know I, I, I respect where they were coming from they they struggled and fought to get mm. me here and and that that was the reality back then so uh, but it is kind of nice you know fast forwarding to my generation where you know if my if my daughters don't speak uh, Russian Spanish and Mandarin I'm I'm a bad parent. Wow. Uh, so it, it is, you know, we, we are evolving somewhat. Mm. I, I did read that actually, that there was a real negative connotation for, for even, ha you know, speaking Spanish and things like that in, in the States up until quite recently. Yeah, I think well, over the last 20 years, it's, it's definitely it's changed. changed. You still find pockets of, of dumb, intolerant people. But mm. I think for the most part, um, there's, a, there's a realization that uh, being multilingual, being multicultural, being uh, aware of the rest of the world and knowledgeable about, about the rest of the world is a, is a good thing. Uh, yeah, it's a huge advantage, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so t how did you find your way to um, study in, in university, some of the best universities in the world? Harvard graduate, you studied at Oxford. Going from, from, you know, a background that would have been harder to access those kind of universities. Yeah. Well, again, three things. I think one is uh, not to be humble, but it, it was a lot easier back then. I, I think it's much, much harder. The competition is much more fierce. So mm. uh, I do think it was easier. Uh, the second thing is, you know, I was, I was born a bit lucky. I, I have a, you know, I was pretty good at test taking. 
and and it's changing somewhat now. But a lot of the uh, the variables and the factors back then that got you into these schools was about standardized test scores. And um, I was always able to punch above my weight. I was able to get higher scores than people way smarter than me because they would get nervous during tests or whatnot. And it's a shame. I see I see kids with my own now. You have brilliant children who. Um, you just, for whatever reason, psychologically have trouble taking tests. So mm. I'm actually glad to see us moving away from those sort of rigid standards. And the last thing is I had a, um, uh, a psycho mom who used to chase me around the house when I was five years old with a laminated multiplication table. And she would, <laughs> this sounds bad now, but it wasn't as bad as that. She would pop me on the, on the butt with the laminated <laughs> multiplication table. So I knew how to do long division when I was five or six. Um, and I was doing... Um, uh, up to her level of mathematics by first grade. So um, what I mean to say is I had a mom who really cared. And um, and even though she didn't have a very advanced level of education, she really, really pushed uh, academic excellence and work ethic. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I, you know, at Harvard and Oxford, I met people and I teach at MIT now. I teach at Columbia University. And uh, all my life I've met people who just have way more intellectual horsepower than I do. Um, but I could work harder than they can. So if you've got some skill, you know, I always tell my, my, my kids, like, you know, you can't be completely athletically incompetent. You're not going to make the NBA. Mm. But if you've got some skill, if you've got some nascent ability, uh, you know, effort can get you Very way fun. farther than your ability ever could. Mm. So, um, so I luck I had some basic academic skills, and then I just sort of outworked folks Everybody and else. that's how and then and then a big part of it's luck and anyone who doesn't anyone who gets into those schools and doesn't acknowledge how how lucky they were you know it could have been that the person reading my essay that day you know just got dumped right yeah. <laughs> something, something bad could have happened uh and and made things go in a very different direction yeah it definitely that's um that seems to be part of it but i really love the you know if you work really hard that it, it can just give you that it, edge open doors that you know um even if you're maybe intellectually or more intelligent than somebody else it's it's hard work that makes a huge difference yeah you know i, I, I my one big lesson from from harvard business school was i'll never forget i took a my second year you, you take some electives i took a, a, a fixed income bond pricing course and I, I, I figured I, I should have it. I should know how to do this stuff. And, um, oh, my God, it was boring to me. It was just absolutely boring. And there was the guy in my class. I won't embarrass him by naming him, but he was a good friend of mine. And there were a lot of smarter people than me at HBS. But I knew I was, I, I was smarter than this guy. I had more intellectual horsepower than this guy. And he ran circles around me in that class. And I remember, like, just asking him one day over beers. I'm like, well, how are you just crushing me in this class? And I realized he, he just loved it. He, he loved something that I just found so tedious and boring. He just found incredible enjoyment in pricing bonds. Wow. Crazy to me, <laughs> yeah. but he did. And I realized, wow, this is what they mean by carpe diem. It's not, it's not some nonsense, you know, you have to enjoy every moment of your life. That's just ridiculous. You have mm. to do things. In, I, don't, I, don't enjoy, I didn't enjoy wiping, changing my daughter's diapers when she mm. was like, but uh, there are things you have to do because you have to do them. Uh, um, but I will say that if you really do have a passion for something, carpe diem is very appropriate because you will outperform your peers mm. and even your peers who are smarter than you and, and better athletes than you intellectually and, and physically. Um, if you do have a passion for it, mm, of course, and um, as a, you're a lecturer now at MIT and you meant on Columbia, what is that? What yep. you really notice with your, the students in your classes now? Yeah, look, like I said, the bar is so much higher, man. These students are so much smarter. They're so much more thoughtful. They're so much, they have so many, so many resources around them. Mm. Imagine like, you know, I, I had early internet and they have chat GPT. So, yeah. so you've got, you know, talent, you've got work ethic, you've got increased competition, which produces, you know, uh, higher performance. And you've got just, you know, resources that I, I couldn't even imagine. Mm. Um, so uh, when I think about the resources available to people, it's extraordinary. The entire MIT first year curriculum is free online. Um, I, I have two daughters, nine mm. and no, turning 10 and six now. Uh, when they fight, my punishment is I shut the internet off. Their devices, not mine. I'm not masochistic. I shut their internet off. And then I say, all right, you guys can't get along, so now you're going to have to get along. If you want internet, you have to do a project together. And I make the nine-year-old write a one-page paper, and then the five-year-old has to draw a picture. And I'll just pick a topic. Any, where do waves come from? How, how does, where does snow come from? I'll just pick a random topic. Find a woman in history who accomplished something great. 
My nine-year-old daughter can sit down with a kid-safe search engine, and in 20 minutes to an hour, depending on the complexity of the topic, research, fact check, and write me a one-page paper on thermodynamics, because she can search for thermodynamics for kids. I mean, I have a stack of them, because they fight all the time. I have a stack of papers (laughs) this big that she's written on her own, Right, I, I would have to. I would have to go to the library when I was her age. Right, it would be impossible for a nine-year-old. Mm. And she's look, she's smart, but she's not a genius. I'm mm. not suggesting she's a genius. Any kid can do this. So think about putting those tools in the hand of a motivated MIT freshman. Yeah, it, it, it's frightening it's how much quality education we can get on our own today. And what about chat GPT? I mean, as a lecturer, how do you see, I mean, that's going to revolutionize education, isn't it? It's good. It is. I'm, I'm optimistic about it. I, I think all this doom and gloom is people trying to sell something. Mm. If I were, if I owned equity in generative AI, I can think of no better marketing gimmick than to be like, it's going to destroy the world. It's so powerful. I, mm. I, I, I am, maybe I'm being blindly, delusionally optimistic, but uh, I think people said that, you know, if you go back to when the calculator was invented, yeah, uh, people said, oh, we're going to lose all of our math skills. Yes, we're yeah, never yeah. going to be good at math anymore, right? So um, I think this is going to augment human intelligence. Um, I think it's going to augment workers. I, I struggle to see a world where people are literally replaced by chat GPT in the short term. And maybe I'm too optimistic. I think it's much more likely that workers will be augmented. Um, and, um, you know, we had, we had an industrial revolution in this country and we have th- three and a half percent unemployment rate right now. Mm. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Maybe I'm being silly, but, um, I think it's wonderful. And, uh, I think that you have like any other new technology, um, you have to be careful, uh, and make sure it has a good rule set around it, social and, and, and governmental. Mm. Uh, but, um, I, my early experiments so far, I've been, it's been a lot of fun. Mm. Uh, my daughter, my t- I have, my daughter has her account and, and she's using it to write her reports. And, um, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, it's certainly incredible. That's for sure. I mean, and the, the latest version is just, you know, it's it's yeah. it's amazing. Um, but it's yeah. I, I agree. I'm on the same page as you. I think it's exciting, and I think like everything like this, it, when it, when something like this uh, comes out, people are just afraid at the beginning, and they just don't yeah. know how it's going to be integrated. But um, it's it's a very exciting time, especially for people in education. Um, and you, so you're, you know, you've got many hats, John, you're an advisor to a senior yeah. advisor to Coinbase. You've had a really illustrious career. You're a lecturer at, at MIT and, and um, at Columbia, like you mentioned. What are, you've also founded Dagger LLC in, in, in the States. Um, what are your, some of the highlights of your career that you personally feel that you've been most proud of? I mean, look, the thing I'm most the thing I'm most proud of outside of my kids um, are is the uh, DME, the Dubai Mercantile Exchange. Mm. Um, you know, it, it was such a fun project. I was so young, um, but what I'm proud about, well, the reason I like it, the reason I, I think that, you know, I, I think about it as that's my legacy to some degree from a business perspective. It wasn't a particularly large deal by UAE standards. It, it's um, uh, you know, it's not uh, the one that people read about most often when they, when they read about the UAE, they think about the hotels and these massive infrastructure projects. Um, but if you go back in time to when that deal was put together and you think about, you know, the U S was not that far, um, from nine 11, it was an extremely tense time. Mm. Any, any middle East U S, uh, discussion was very tense the notion of putting a capitalist me- so that's on the U S side, mm. right? On the, on the Middle East side, the, the idea of, the idea of pricing crude oil, uh, which obviously has, you know, strong political, social, even religious connotations with the Middle East. Um, the idea of pricing that using a capitalist mechanism, a free market in exchange to price mm. crude oil. Um, again, now, now it's, it's not, but back then that was fairly provocative. So mm. you had two, two sovereign nations, both facing internal confusion, internal uh, uh, hes- re- re- hesitancy against, the, against moving, progressing too far in that in, in a given direction, say, we are going to do this. We're going we're gonna to do this because it's the right thing to do, because this is the right partnership. Um, and we're going to ignore all this noise 
and we are going to build this exchange. And, and exchanges are unique types of businesses. Like, uh, not to begrudge like the real estate deals and all of that, but exchanges are kind of like soccer fields. Mm. You know, there you build this field, and then you've got all these stakeholders who kind of, the field. The, the field may be a beautiful field, but the field in some ways is the least important part. The field is the platform on which. Everything else builds, the teams, the fans, mm. the concessions, right? The, all of that excitement, all of that social, the, the social coming together that, that a football field uh, puts to, gives to a country, gives to a, a domicile. Um, exchanges are kind of like that for financial services, right? They're the field, and then on that you have stakeholders, you have trading entities, you have broker-dealers, you've got regulatory, um, and then all of that meets together and you get price discovery. Um, which was the really amazing part of it, right? I, mean, I remember the delegation from Dubai coming over uh, back then when was the New York Mercantile Exchange, which was the, the, the crude oil exchange, the commodities exchange. And I remember telling them something about, about what happened in New York after 9-11, how um, the government, our government wanted the stock exchange and the commodities exchange opened first, right away, get them open. Mm. They're not, again, they're not the most profitable businesses on wall street. They're not the, you know, the multi, multi billion dollar institutions on wall street. They're not the, the names you think about like BlackRock and Goldman Sachs and whatnot. Why was it so important to get the stock exchange and commodities exchange open? Because price discovery emanates from it mm. and everything in finance starts with price discovery. You can't, you don't know. I'm a little bit weird and I, I graduated Harvard business school. I didn't go into investment banking. I didn't go into hedge funds. I probably should have, I probably a lot wealthier, but, but, uh, I won't bore you with the whole story, but through a strange no. sequence of events, I got pulled into the New York mercantile exchange, which is again, non-traditional for a typical business school graduate. Um, exchanges themselves are kind of like boring businesses. They're not, you know, they're almost like social utilities. You match up buyers and sellers. Mm. But what's powerful about them is a ra- like, like, um, uh, like a soccer field. They're a platform on which all of this amazing stuff happens. Um, you know, trading, clearing, custody, banking, and, and, and what comes out of exchanges are prices. And price discovery Without that, the entire financial system grinds to a halt mm. because if, if, just like if you don't know what the interest rate is, you can't, you can't do anything. If you don't know what the price of your equity is, you can't do anything so, or your commodity. So they're very, very important for financial infrastructure. And, and the UAE got that. They, were, they, they looked at it and said, okay, well, we want to be a financial center. We are becoming a financial center. One thing that defines a financial center is important price infor- information emanates from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember bringing the delegation from Dubai to the NYMEX floor, which back then was open outcry. It was a bunch of guys screaming and yelling and setting the price of uh, the world's most important commodity. And I remember one of the guys from Dubai had not been there yet. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, wait, wait till you see our, our souk. Wait till you see our gold souk. And I remember the first time I flew out there, I went to the gold, they took me to the gold souk. And I was like, oh, okay, they, they get it. They know exactly what we do. It's like, it's just, everyone's just dressed differently. That's it. Everyone's doing exactly, they're setting, they're, they're setting price discovery through chaos. And out of this chaos comes order, which is a price of what something's worth. Um, so yeah, it was, it was so much fun to be a part of that project because on a, on a political level, economic level, mm. you know, I'll go so far as to say as a social level, like mm. how wonderful was it to show the world that when, when the U S and the middle East, when they, when they approach each other out of respect, uh, you produce these amazing cooperative deals. Mm. And the UAE has such a great history of, you know, being so innovative and, you know, visionary in what, in what, yeah. in, in its leadership and what the country has achieved. So that was, that was Absolutely. not long after 9-11. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was, uh, we started looking at this stuff. Um, no, this is not long after. This is, uh, this is less than two years that we wow. did this deal. So, um, uh, you know, and there, and, and so there was, we, we overcame a lot of, um, inertia. Mm. Um, now this inertia was not based on anything logical, but just because, just because it's not logical doesn't mean it can't, uh, stop transactions. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and on on the side of the UAE, right again, this, this, the UAE was very progressive of the UAE to say, we're going to establish this business that will use capitalist mechanisms to price crude oil. That was not obvious back Mm. in 2003, 2005, that that was not an obvious thing that you would say, sure, we can do that. We had to go and speak to the Omanis about getting their permission to use their crude as the foundation of the contract. Uh, the Saudis wanted to say, I mean, this is, this was, this was 
both countries, this was both companies pushing the envelope of what was considered acceptable Mm -hmm. within their world. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so proud of it. Not because it was, you know, billions and billions of dollars or anything like that. I look to that and say, wouldn't it be wonderful if more deals like that existed? Yeah, it would certainly would be. And what about your your career as at Coinbase? It now seems like a very exciting time in the world of cryptocurrencies, um, yeah. especially given the events of the last few weeks. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I um, I started at the NYMEX. Like I said, I started. I walked onto the floor. I was a freshly minted MBA from Harvard. <laughs> And I walked on to this floor, (laughs) I knew nothing, which means I knew knew nothing. I knew nothing. I knew how to BS. That's basically all I knew. (laughs) And so I walk on this floor and I feel like I'm transported to 1940. Like, again, 2000, when I graduated, we're not talking about 1962, like 2002, 2003, we had electronic trading. Mm. Um, But there were 868 guys or so, I forget how many, screaming and yelling and throwing paper tickets into this kid in the center of a pit and they would scoop it up every seven minutes or so and run it downstairs. The whole thing was so crazy, but it worked really well. It actually worked really well, but it was so anachronistic and um, I was lucky. I got to see that. Now, I wouldn't have wanted to live in that for too long, but I got to see the end of it and I got to be part of the team that moved into the modern era. Mm. And I heard all the complaints. I heard all the, it's ne- this electronic trading's never going to work. Open outcry is the way to go. You guys are idiots. I heard the complaints in government about how derivatives trading in general was nonsense because it was based on nothing and this is all BS and blah, 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 blah. And then we obviously, you know, pushed along and modernized the exchange. And then that global commodities market has only grown by, by multiples. So fast forward 15 years later or so, I get to do it again, which is really cool. I get to see another transition from, I want to be very clear. I, I hate these people who say like everybody who does it the old way is, is dumb or no, cause, cause I, I pointed out the NYMEX floor worked really well. Mm-hmm. This chaotic, crazy system actually was incredibly effective. And I remember one of the old traders who didn't want it to change uh, pulled me aside and he said, you know what? what the problem is, Johnny? There's a reason the design of the spoon hasn't changed since the day of the caveman. (laughs) It works. It just works. And we can laugh at that. And of course, it's kind of disingenuous. But it's not wrong. He's not. He's not wrong. No, like yeah. the design of the spoon is pretty darn good, right? So you don't just change things for the sake of changing them. So um, I, I, I'm very, I'm very respectful of inertia mm-hmm. because there's good inertia and there's bad inertia. The good inertia is switching cost, is reliability. You don't just, you know, you have a very reliable system. Price discovery is very important. You can't just roll in one day and say we're going to change everything for the sake of changing mm-hmm. it. Um, it's like, it's like rolling in and saying, I have a better design for airplane engines. Mm-hmm. Okay. I hope you're great. I, I know they evolve over time, but I don't want to be the first one <laughs> to yeah. test out your design, no. right? Airplanes are very safe, mm-hmm. right? Now, of course, a hundred years from now, we will use different technology in airplanes, but there is a process to ensure that that safety is maintained as we evolve. Mm-hmm. And that process can be annoyingly slow to the person who genuinely has a better design for airplane engines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's purpose. You still have to go through the process. You still have to go through the process. Mm-hmm. You can't, you just, if you just show up one day and you've redesigned airplane engines and you're right, you, you've nailed it. It's more efficient. It's safe for this or that. You still have to go through the process of ensuring the system can transition. Mm-hmm. So these are important systems we're talking about. Financial systems are important systems. Of course. So I'm not like one of these crypto guys that says, oh, everybody who doesn't want to immediately go to tokenization is an idiot. I, I, no, that's not true. There, there, we have to prove that we can maintain safety, stability, efficiency, reach access, government control, um, anti money laundering. all of those things have to be proved, borne out. But I know that we're moving in this direction. Mm-hmm. I, I know it will happen. Now, mm-hmm. I, I hope it happens in my lifetime. If I'm um, just part of my, my career, I should say, but if I'm just part of moving the needle so that my daughter lives in a much more efficient world, um, I'm happy to be a part of that. But I, I get to see two transitions in one lifetime, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that is really exciting. And that, that just shows yeah. you how much things yeah. are, how fast things are moving as, as we go along, right? I mean, it, it took ages to get to that first 
big change where you know that like you're saying that the floor yeah. moved to electronic trading and now we're yeah. in the ai time and chat gpt and cryptocurrencies um so i guess it's normal that a lot of people resist that change but it it's it's moving yeah. in that direction um john what is what's the best advice that you've ever received so okay so the best advice I've ever received is a permutation. I've heard it in many different forms, a permutation of no one is looking at you when you dance. Mm. My mother told me this when I was a kid. Uh, I'll give you two pieces. I'm one for my mom, one for my dad. My mom told me, um, my parents were really good dancers. Really? They were well, really, they were really Italians. good dancers. <laughs> yeah, but they, they were like, they would love, at weddings, like it was a big thing and they would clear the dance floor out. And I was always scared. My mother would always want to come dance with me when I was a kid. And I was always scared. And um, I was embarrassed. And I remember her telling me when I was really young, nobody's watching you. They're focused on themselves. You know, That's they don't, your, 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 your perception of how, what they think about you, A, is, is misappropriated. It's not, they just don't care. Mm. B, you know, who cares what they say? Uh, who cares what they think? But that was the most important piece was because we all care what other people think, right? Yeah. You need to tell someone, don't, don't, we all care. But we're really, the, the eye-opening piece was, you know, no one's looking at you. No one's focused on you. So don't let that be a, a lack of impetus for wanting to do something different. So, for example, when I joined NYMEX, um, you know, typical Harvard Business School graduate, you know, I had an offer, I had an offer on the table from Goldman Sachs. And I thought about it and I said, okay, um, just like when I went car shopping recently with my wife, we had to choose between two cars. Um, if I close my eyes and drive these cars, they feel the same to me. In fact, I prefer this one, but this other one is much flashier and I'm drawn to it. Why am I, why do I want the one that I like the one that drives better? Spending less money is better than spending more. What's pulling me in this direction. Oh, I realize that cause I want people to see me in this car. Mm. And, um, that's the opposite of being embarrassed, but it's the same core concept, mm. right? So, um, Realizing that so much of us is driven, by, so much of who we are is driven by that. Even if you're not that type, even if you're like, I'm not that type of person, we all are that type of person. So, so constantly fighting against it. So when I got this job, this crazy job offer at the NYMEX, NYMEX Goldman Sachs, right? No comparison, which is more prestigious. No comparison, which has a higher probability of leading to to um, monetary success. Um, and I'm sitting there with my now wife, former you know, at the time girlfriend, you know, wrestling with it, and she was like. This is a no-brainer. Listening, to, listening to you talk. Every, everything, every pro item. Do the pro-con list. Every pro for taking the prestigious job is based on what other people would perceive. Not a single thing you've said is based on you being happy. Mm. So that's that's um, you know nobody cares. Nobody's watching you. You know, do what makes you do what makes you happy. Was my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is my dad always used to say, and this is very important in crypto. A man is judged by the shoes he wears and the company he keeps. Oh, um, a man is judged by the shoes he wears and the company he keeps. Yeah, I've always liked that. Um, That's awesome. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, and, and and people mistake it. They think when you say shoes he wears, they go, oh, that means you have to wear you know expensive shoes. No, it's if you wear work boots, if you you know, it, it's it's, mm. it's indicative of your shoes. You can't you can't live your life. Your shoes are the first thing you need, right? You can you can. You know, you, you, you look at somebody's shoes, you get a sense for their priorities in life. Let's put it that way. Mm. Um, that's the kind of the analogy, I think, the metaphor. Um, and then the company he keeps. Um, and those two could not be more diametrically opposed, right? One is aesthetics, mm. um, how you present yourself to the world. The other is the type of character you have mm -hmm. by, by who you want to surround yourself with. So mm -hmm. um, I do think it's very, very important um, to to think about that. I think industries have to think about that as well. Like you know, we, we, we have to be thoughtful about who we allow to represent our industry mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and who we allow to, to be active in our industry. Um, the NYMEX guys had this great thing. So they, they, once in a while, we, when it was open outcry, once in a while, a trader would come up complaining that the, the trade, the other traders were breaking the rules. Okay. And so for example, like if, 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 if something's, if somebody's offering something, I'll sell it to you for six, and you raise your hand and say, I'll buy it for six. Part of the rule of the floor is they have to, they have to sell it to you. Of course. Right? Yeah. And once in a while a trader will come up and say, I'm bidding six and they're selling it 
to the other guy for five dollars and ninety cents, and that's not the best price. And you know what's going on? And Shimon, nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, what was happening was that trader, that guy was complaining. He had broken one of the unofficial rules. He had done something that made everybody else angry in mm-hmm. the pit, and they were punishing him. Oh. And usually the thing he had done was unethical. Okay. So there was this sort of social justice. There was this, that guy wow. did something unethical that's going to get us all in trouble. You know, he did, a, he, did a, he did something you're not supposed to do. He banged the clothes, or there's all these, like, little tricks the traders would do. And they were smart enough to know, if we, if we, if we do this too much, uh, you know, the, the regulator's going to come in, right? So, so if somebody got too greedy on the floor, they would pr- have social justice. They would ignore him. For a couple of days just to teach him a lesson because remember if, he, if he's not trading he's not making money right yeah. so they would teach him a lesson so um i i believe in that i believe i believe the industry has to self-police mm. and part of the way you self-police is when you know you have a bad actor in your midst you don't deal with them mm-hmm. you don't enable them mm-hmm. now sometimes it's hard because that bad actor could be a very important part of the ecosystem mm-hmm. um but i do think healthy ecosystems self-correct and that's what's happening now with crypto, really, the whole, well, I mean, bit by bit, it's been, yeah. yeah. I hope so. I hope the tolerance for bad actors goes up. Mm. It, it's, it's, look, when the, when, the, when the wound is fresh, everybody talks about ethics, everybody talks about good behavior. I hope that, that we've, we've elevated a level where that type of activity will not be tolerated by regulators, but also by ourselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mean, th- that story has come from those those pieces of advice. I mean, do you think that, you know, those two pieces of advice from your parents, like your mom saying no one's looking at you when you're dancing and your dad saying a man is judged by his shoes and the company he keeps. Did, did that guide your career the most or were there were there other? Absolutely. People? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my mom's advice, look, I, I made a decision when I graduated HBS. Um, everybody should have a mantra, a credo they live by. My credo is whoever dies with the best stories wins. <laughs> so I, I optimized, I optimized for an interesting life, not mm. for money. Um, I don't begrudge anyone who optimizes for money. Uh, good, good for you. Uh, yeah, I certainly like money. I don't know. No, <laughs> but, yeah, um, of course. But, but, I, but I, do, I do think you need to make a choice. I, I, when young people come to me about career stuff, I, said, I, I do think that one important thing you have to decide about what, wh- who you are is are you going to optimize for experiences or money? Mm-hmm. Some people get both. And I think that's good for them. They're smarter than I am. Um, but I, uh, you know, that's why I took the NYMEX job is I just said that's going to be a more interesting life. And then one day when the chairman stuck his head out the door and said, who wants to go to Dubai? I'm getting a, I got a weird phone call from people in Dubai. They want us to go look at open up an exchange. It's probably never going to work. You know, who wants to go? And you know, now everybody wants to go to Dubai. 15 yeah. years ago, not that many hands went up, that's but so true. I shot my hand up and said, let me go. So, um, uh, you know, yeah. So that definitely has shaped who I am. And that was such an amazing experience, like to come here that early and really help form what was going to happen or how the region was going to develop its financial markets. Like that's incredible, considering where it is now. Oh, it was, it was. You know, they, they joke about all the cranes being there. I never know if those rumors are true or not. But for me, it was always it was less. Yeah, the financial infrastructure, the real estate, all that was amazing. It was it was exciting to watch. I just could never get over, and I, I still see it to this day, but especially 15 years ago, the excitement, the passion, the energy, the pride, the openness, the the interest. I mean, I've never been asked more questions about uh-huh. myself than I, when I was in Dubai 15 years ago. People were just like sponges wanting to, you know, I remember, I remember people telling me when I was leaving the airport, like random people who work at the airport, I hope you had a great time here. Tell your friends. Tell yeah. Americans. Let everyone know how friendly we are, how much we want want you here. Mm. Um, I, you know, there's been a few places, Vietnam, a few other places where where I've seen that, but um, uh, it was it's just extraordinary. Saudi, no, that's the next one. <laughs> yeah, I just I just was in Riyadh. I was just in Riyadh, and I checked into the hotel, and I gave the gentleman my passport, and he came around the desk, and he took my hands, and he said, I you have any problems, you call me. I want you to have a great time. Mm. I want you to go back and tell everyone in America how wonderful it is here. R- Riyadh is, is, is 
is where it, the, where the it's energy at. level is very much like Dubai 15 years ago. Yeah, it's crazy. It's 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 an incredible. There's an incredible vibe happening there at the moment. It really is exciting. Um, and John, when when you mentioned just now about when students come to you for career advice, what what advice do you give young people or your students who come to you looking for advice in their careers? I mean, is there something particular that you know now that you'd wish you wish you'd known then when you started that you share with them or are there any tip bits of advice yeah, so, that you give them? Yeah, sure. I, I, the first thing I tell them is don't listen to anyone uh, in the sense of don't, don't, don't idolize anyone. Cause mm. all of us are just winging it. We're just winging it. Like I, I, I have friends who come to me cause they're going to have a baby and they want advice about raising their kid. I'm like, I, I'm <laughs> just making it up as I go along. I mean, if, if you've got a friend with like 40 kids, maybe they know something, but, but, um, so the first piece of advice is no one has the answers and mm. that's okay. Mm-hmm. That's, that's okay. Um, second piece of advice though, is I will say back to my, what I said before is, is I do think you have to kind of know who you are and know what drives you. So you don't necessarily have to like state it in, in interviews, but you should know, am I someone driven more by money, mm-hmm. money, power experiences? I think those are the three simple, uh, personality characteristics, um, that, that, that motivate people. Mm-hmm. So under, and by the way, that may change. Mm-hmm. It may change when you have kids, but, but, but be, know who you are. Like mm-hmm. no, try to know who you are, understand it might change. Uh, mm-hmm. one piece of advice I give dads, for example, is, uh, I can only speak to dads of daughters. That's what I know is I say, okay, by the time as a, t- as, as a man, as for me at least, by the time you're 30 or so, you kind of know who you are mm-hmm. emotionally, mm-hmm. Like, you know, I- I'm a guy who cries at funerals or I'm a guy who doesn't, I'm a guy who cries at movies. You kind of got to know your general emotional makeup, throw all that stuff out the window. <laughs> because when you have kids. I wasn't a big, oh my, I wasn't a big crier. My daughters make me cry once a week. Oh, they, um, the, oh, they have this movie that there's a scene that makes me cry because it's, it's a dad and his daughter. Which movie and is it? it's so funny. It's called Storks. Okay. It's actually a dad and his son, but it's about like the dad recognizing the son is going to grow up and not want to play with him anymore. And my daughters, they, they, they set that scene up in the movie when their friends are over and then they go, we're going to make our daddy cry. It's funny. And they drag me into the room. And as soon as I see the scene, I start to hear Oh my God. And they play. They forced me to watch the scene. So, but this is, this is wonderful because this is a thing that I, I, I changed. I was completely different. So, um, you can decide when you're younger, I want to aggregate experiences. Then you get older and say, I really want to focus on money. That's fine. Yeah. That, that's nobody, nobody's watching you dance. Mm, nobody's watching Nobody you dance. cares. Yeah. But know, but know who you are and, and dive into that. And that's going to optimize your probability of success. And is that how you measure success now? It, it, I mean, you seem like you've, you know, like you said, you you prioritized experiences at the beginning of your career. You, you wanted to for be, me. yeah, for you. How do you yeah. prioritize or how do you measure success now? What yeah. does it mean to you? So again, it's changed. When I was when I was single, it was having really cool stories. Mm. That was that's what success was for me. Mm-hmm. Um, when I got married, it was you know that relationship, like mm-hmm. balancing, it was, it's, can I, can I be, uh, can I have a good great one. relationship, a great partner, but also continue to achieve success. Uh, and anyway, for me, success was collecting stories. I also like being, uh, I like being an expert in something. Of that's, that's, that's what drives me. I like, I like being known as an expert in something. Mm-hmm. So building my expertise in certain areas, that's what, that's how I define success. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I became a dad. And then, uh, then, then it, you know, add that element. And now it's, uh, I view success through my, my daughter's eyes. Mm-hmm. So are they gonna, are they proud of me? Mm-hmm. Um, because what's great about doing it that way with kids is, um, my daughter is proud of me. Um, you know, she doesn't really understand. I mean, they kind of understand what money is, but she's not driven by money. She doesn't see my paycheck. So that mm-hmm. doesn't, she doesn't care about that. She cares about me balancing work, marriage, children. Mm-hmm. She's the best barometer of whether I'm able to, to, to be a well-rounded human being and also be a kind human being. So all those things plus kind, if I can pull all that off, there's no better barometer than my daughter. So if she's into me, because as everyone's parents know, your kids like, you know, yeah. you, you sense their temperature. You mm-hmm. sense their temperature. You really do. And if she's like excited to see me and she's, you know, won't let me go when I hug her, when I hug her to hug her to go to bed, you know, um, if she's into me, then, then I know I'm doing something you're right. Doing something right. That's amazing. And yeah. so being a good dad is the 
being yeah but, well, being a good dad is about being a good person being, and, a good being person. happy you know, that, that, you know when you're on a plane right what do they tell you put your own mask on first. first then put your children's mask on mm. so i'm a big believer that if i'm if i'm working out if i'm doing well at work if i'm getting along with my wife right mm. if, if everything's firing then the children sense it. They, 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 they just, they sense that something's like, if, if everything else isn't firing and I go buy her a gift, she'll be happy for five minutes yeah. for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But, but, but then it'll go back into this tension. Mm -hmm. So, um, you being a parent, it's not just about, in my view, my humble opinion, not just doting on your children. No, it's a um, that's a good, good recipe for producing spoiled children in a bad life. Yeah. Um, if, if everything's firing and I, and I'm running on all engines, then my kids are happy. Yeah. Happy parents, happy child. Yeah, it's um, it's so profound. There's no question. Yeah, yeah. They 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 feed. They're, they're like they're like mediums. Mm. They can feed off of energy. Like you have a fight with your spouse, they may not hear it, but they know. But they're feeling that energy mm. in 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 the room. You know? John, do you have any regrets? Oh my God, tons. <laughs> no. I'm riddled. I'm riddled. I can't sleep at night because I always think about. I always think about what if I had done this in the past or that in the past. I mean, I feel like I have. I have the two types of regrets. I have regrets where I'm like, you know, there's three types. There's like, like ugh, you know, those when you cringe, you realize that you said or did something really dumb. Yes. And you, you <laughs> yeah. know, those like those regrets, That's right? Um, I definitely have some of those. Um, you know, you miss something in the spreadsheet and like, you know, just, just, you made a boo-boo, like just yeah. a dumb mistake, right? I have tons of those. I make mistakes all the time. The more, the more like, uh, I think important regrets, um, you know, you think about, I, I think about times when I didn't do something, mm. not when I did the wrong thing, but I, I had the opportunity to do something great, to do something kind, to do something like that would have, you know, made it a great story. Mm. And I didn't cause I was scared or I was lazy or, uh, you know, those are the types of regrets that I, I really think about a lot, mm -hmm. uh, turning down opportunities to explore things because I was, you know, scared or lazy. Um, uh, and then, and then the last kind of regret I think is, um, you know, you know, just, uh, again, for me, I, quite frankly, I, I made a stupid decision recently where I went to attend a conference and I missed uh, my daughter's birthday party. And, you know, I rationalized it at the time. She had, had two other smaller parties, but, but, um, you know, but this was the big one. This was the one that she was going to remember. Mm. And, um, I just, it was okay. such a bad, bad calculus on my part to, 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 to give up, to, to, to take, to accept a commoditized thing, which is there are a million conferences, mm. you know, they have them every year to, to trade a commodity product for a product that is, has only one instance. Yeah. It's just it was, insane. Well, insane. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it won't happen. You'll never do that again. At least you know, you know, it's you live and learn, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. But I think look, I think regrets are. If you don't have regrets, I think you're you're narcissistically delusional. Of course, I mean, I mean, I mean that's, that's, all, that's all I think about at night. I know. I, I mean, people. I mean, I suppose you can say you've no regrets, as in you made the mistake. You know, you made it, but you learned from it, right? But of course, we all must have loads of regrets, or oh, I should have done things this way but then you wouldn't even be the person that you are it's part of it's part of learning but it's interesting to hear yep. about what people um what people just feel this, just this morning i've had this thing in my mind all morning I, I, I was running into work i was late uh i had a call at 8 a.m i was leaving a bit early dropped the kids off at school rushing through the subway and i was rushing out and i saw this woman with a small child and she had like a bag and you know she was she was she seemed strong so she was able to pick everything up and go up the steps and my instinct is always I would go to help her and I was just rushed. Yeah. And so I just kind of looked at her and then she seemed like, Oh, she's fine. And I ran up the stairs. I ran back and it's, the subway happens to have like three sets of stairs. And I ran up to my office, jumped on the call and I thought about it. I was like, you know what? I had 10 minutes. I could have helped her. And that's like been on my mind all day. Oh my like, God. I do, I'm like, anno I'm annoyed with myself and I'll have to go do, I'll have to go do something later to make, to up, make up for to it. To balance out the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I'm like, I, I want to be that man. That's the man I want to be. And if you want to be that person, you're only that person if you do those things. Yeah. You, can, you, can think you're, you can think you're a certain way all you want. Yeah. If you don't actually do it, then you're not that person. Yeah, I know. So I, I wasn't the man I, was, I, I, I try to be this morning and just because I was selfish. I, that's such a good example. I love it. I love that. That's a really good one to, a good one to think about. Um, 
Okay, John, I don't want to take up too much more of your time because you've been really generous to speak to us. But just the last just quick um, kind of, you know, tip bit questions. Best a movie or a book that most impacted your life that you could share with um, some of the listeners sure. that they could check out? Well, I'd say Rigged by Ben Mesrick. Um, <laughs> yes, kidding, of course. But, but, but it is a really cool book. It is an awesome uh, because book. I think it's, uh, yeah. No, I'd say, I'd say um, The Sorrows of Young Werther. Say I again? I don't... Um, the Sorrows of Young Werther. Okay. W-E-R-T-H-E-R. Um, it's a very sad book. Uh, and it has a really macabre history. It inspired a rash of suicides uh, because it romanticized the notion of suicide, which is horrific. So um, I don't like it for those reasons because people might listen and say all that because it, it has connotations. Um, I just, I just, it, it's a, it's a, it's a book that's told from the point of view of letters written. Mm. Um, and again, it's uh, this idea of like aggregating stories mm-hmm. probably is part of why I, I believe in this um, and how we tell our lives through the stories that we, we engage in and the stories that we create in our own lives. Mm. And it's this story of a young man sharing who he is by a series of letters, which are a series of stories as opposed to a traditional narrative, mm-hmm. it's a very beautiful haunting book with a very bad ending. Um, but it really kind of, it really sort of made me think about who, what, what legacy we leave. Um, and again, it's these, it's these stories of who we are and how we impact people. So um, I would say rigged, they couldn't be more diametrically opposed, yeah. but, uh, but, but rigged and, um, and, this, and then there's one more I'll mention because I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's kind of cool. Um, uh, it's about the Archbishop of Canada. It's called murder in a, Cath- murder in the cathedral. Oh, it's I've actually heard a about play. That. Yeah. It's the Archbishop. It's the story of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it's based on a well. It's based on kind of a true story, um, where um, uh, effectively the Catholic Church was going to kill the Archbishop mm-hmm. of Canterbury because he refused to um, he refused to do what they wanted, uh, basically, which was to um, uh, uh, forgive the king's wife, more or less. So they were going to kill him, and the whole uh, play is set in this church, and he's waiting to be killed. So it's just, it's a monologue effectively, and he's getting ready to be killed. And the devil, to tempt him, sends three tempters. And the first tempter promises him uh, money. Okay. And he says, I don't need money. I'm, an, I'm, I'm a priest. I don't need money. And he b- 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 brushes him off. The second tempter tempts the earthly delights, other earthly delights. And he says, nope, I don't need any of that stuff. I'm off. The third tempter, which is the devil himself, shows up and just says, you know what? You win. You win. Good job. Bravo. Those guards are going to come in soon. They're going to murder you. And you're going to be famous. You're going to be a martyr. And you're going to go down in history. And we all know that's the real reason you're doing this. And leaves. And then there's this wonderful monologue where he's first is like, oh, yeah, that devil is silly. And then he slowly starts thinking, oh, you know what? Like, part of me does want to be seen as standing up for the glory of God. And like, and, and he starts to have this wonderful exploration. And, and the net result is he basically comes to this point. He has this great line, can I neither act nor suffer without perdition? And it's this realization that we're imperfect creatures. And he, so he eventually comes, he starts off like, oh, I'm a horrible person. Mm. I'm, 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 not, I'm not a good worshiper of, of, of the Lord because I do want these things. If I'm mm. honest with myself, I do want that fame. And then he comes full circle and realizes that's part of the human condition. We're not perfect. We are selfish. We're not perfectly altruistic. Why do I want to go help, help that woman today? There's a tiny part of me that wants people to see. Oh, look um, how good I am. I'm helping her. It's true. If we're honest with ourselves, we do want acclaim. Hmm. And so the, the point he makes in the book is, uh, the play is, it's okay. Now, it's it a- shouldn't be what drives it. It shouldn't be 100% because no, then you become yeah. like a social, social media influencer that just wants credit for everything. But, but it's okay that we're imperfect creatures. It's okay to want money. It's okay to want fame. It's okay to want to be viewed as, as famous and special. But those things can't drive you yeah. 100%, right? That is a beautiful story. I'm definitely going to yeah. check. That is, that's brilliant. Yeah. Because that is, that's really powerful. That's awesome. I love that because even I mean Look, even don't hate yourself. Yeah. No, I know. Don't hate yourself because you have these these characteristics. Yeah, we okay. all have we a all little do. bit of ego, you know. Even yeah. if you work on it all the time, that you're like a, you don't want to have an ego and you're not Eckhart Tolle, but um, it's still there a little bit, you know. And but it shouldn't stop you sure. from doing the right thing. Or, or well, being well a good use person. that. Use those flaws to 
benefit yourself in society. Mm. So I, I want people to think I'm a good guy, so I'll go do good guy do things. things. That's okay. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Well, John, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a brilliant conversation, you. and you've had so like shared so many awesome learnings and things that people can take into their lives and think about. So we really, really appreciate your time today. Well, well you're an inspiration as well. Your story of what you've done uh, as a woman and, and the mm-hmm. success you've achieved, and, and there, it's, it's, it's your story is fantastic. I hope you tell your story. Uh, you should be interviewed as well. Thanks, John. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll speak sure. to you soon and look forward to hoping maybe in a year or two having you on again. That would be awesome. A- absolutely. All the best. Thank you. Thanks.